Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk this morning about uh, open education and what I'm going to do in the next 30 to 34 minutes if the timings work out as planned is uh, share with you a bit about why and how uh, we at Spark have expanded our work beyond open access to journal articles and into the much larger arena of open education. Um, open educational resources, yes, but ultimately into the operation of higher education institutions writ large. And I'll share some thoughts on actions that I think we can and need to take to ensure that we have an equitable, inclusive, and open ecosystem, not just for research, but for education as well. Make sure the slides advance. Um, after all, uh, Spark's mission uh, has been and is to set the default to open in research and education. And for the first decade or so of our operations, we primarily concentrated on promoting the adoption of open access in the journal arena, um, which is the area of most central concern to our members. We're a library membership organization of academic and research libraries nested on college and university campuses in the US and Canada. And we, like many of you in the room, advocated for open access in order to uh, really to change, uh, address inequities that we saw in the journal uh, publication system. In specific, spiraling costs, the resulting lack of access that these costs led to, once you could get to, to journal articles, the lack of utility that we found, and as we heard so eloquently yesterday in the second panel, the limited inclusion of voices in the scholarly converse, conversation in the journal world, uh, concerns over what was happening in terms of commercial consolidation in that market, et cetera, et cetera. And we focused initially on this, not because our library members themselves needed a better solution, but because the students and faculty on the campuses that we serve needed it. We would hear time and time again uh, from, uh, from students, from, from uh, rank and file faculty and from students about the net negative effect that uh, lack of access had on them. And I know you're all familiar with these stories, right, which generally start out by saying, the lack of access has prevented me from doing something. I lo we love this quote from Gary Ward from the University of Vermont for two reasons. I mean, one, because it encapsulated what the problem was in terms of getting access to journal articles. You end up doing your research on what you have access to rather than what you need to know. But it was the second half of this statement that really you know, kind of caught our attention and, and made us really sit up and think. You end up teaching, he ends up teaching his students what he has access to rather than what they really need to know. And we heard these kinds of refrains over and over again, and it struck us as a very crucial point because journals and journal articles are, or at least should be, routinely used in classrooms for teaching and learning. They are critical educational resources. And when you think about it, that's been part of the ethos of the open access movement from the beginning. When the Budapest Declaration uh, on Open Access was, was crafted, it explicitly called out the need to open up journal materials in order to not only accelerate research, but also enrich education. It was an explicit part of the OA movement from uh, the get-go. So we thought about it and thought about it at Spark and ultimately decided to do, try and do something about it. And about seven years ago, uh, we were very lucky to get the generous support of the William and, uh, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Uh, to, it gave us money to start a program to begin to dig into uh, the need for opening up access to educational materials. And we were super, super fortunate to lure the absolutely fantastic Nicole Allen away from the US Public Interest Research Group where she was leading uh, campaigns for student textbook affordability on campuses uh, into Spark, where she now leads our globally recognized program on open education and open educational resources. If you want to find out more about any, anything to do with open education or OER, she's an incredible expert, and her Twitter handle is up there. I, I just like her picture, too, but uh, her Twitter handle is up there, so please follow her, and, and you will find out all the details that I don't have time to tell you in 30 minutes. Um, so when we, when we made this move and we brought Nicole sort of into the fold, right off the bat, we saw striking similarities between the issues in the textbook market and the journal market, in terms, really in terms of the kinds of inequities and dysfunctions that existed in both. 
The first time, in fact, I ever saw Nicole present uh, on the issue of, uh, of uh, open textbooks, I, th I was watching her go through her slide deck and I was like, she stole my slides or she's using the same slides I'm using. This is like, there's something really weird here. Um, I think everybody's familiar with the sort of iconic description, the slide that describes what's happening, what has happened over the past two decades in terms of rising journal prices in comparison with library budgets and more importantly, the consumer price index. Nicole was using a slide and continues to use a slide that looks strikingly similar in the textbook market. Over uh, the past two, two decades, the prices of academic textbooks for universities and colleges uh, students have increased about 240% over the same amount of time. So that comparison to the CPI looks pretty much exactly the same. There's also similarities in terms of how the market functions and in the textbook arena that look very similar to the journal marketplace. We have intermediaries that blunt price sensitivity in both markets. In the journal world, librarians buy on behalf of our patrons on campus, so our patrons are sort of shielded from the actual price tag of subscriptions by and large. In the textbook market, uh, professors make the decision about what materials, what textbooks and learning materials students then need to buy in order to complete their classes. So professors make decisions irrespective of price and students are left having to figure out how to pay for it. So that intermediary uh, uh, function looked the same in both markets. And we also see consolidation of control by commercial uh, companies in both markets. In the U.S. college textbook markets, right now, three companies uh, control about 85% um, of, of the market. And that's about to get smaller if the merger of the, 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 the main players are Pearson, McGraw-Hill, and Cengage. And right now, uh, McGraw-Hill and Cengage have announced their intent to merge. So we're looking at having the market controlled by uh, roughly two players. Um, and initially, this is you know, sort of interesting and alarming, but our library member said it's not our problem, right? This is not a library issue. But the more we sort of presented the net effects of what was happening in the, in the learning materials and textbook market to them, the more I think they understood that it's actually, it, it is their problem because they are part of the higher education ecosystem and institutions. In the textbook market, these costs were having real effects on students on our member libraries' campuses uh, 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 that, that were real and tangible. These costs hit students hard. Two in three students say that at some point in their higher education career, they've decided against buying a textbook for a course that they are taking because the cost is too high. One out of every two students say they've taken fewer courses because they couldn't afford the textbooks. They had to delay being able to take classes. And less than half of all students uh, surveyed, and this, the material comes from uh, the US PERG, the public, public Interest Research Group, who tracks this year in, year out. Less than half of students actually purchase a current edition of a textbook for the classes that they're taking in any given semester. The bottom line is that students can't learn from materials they can't afford, right? The low lack of affordability of textbooks and learning materials leads to really poor learning outcomes and not just low test scores or poor grades. It lowers course completion rates. Students drop courses because they can't keep up without the textbooks. And ultimately, it leads to lower graduation rates on our campuses. These are all things that are of central interest to the operations of higher education institutions. As we dug into uh, what was happening in the education uh, mater and learning materials market, we recognized that a promising strategy to deal with these huge issues really closely paralleled our strategy in the open access to journal articles movement, right? No surprise, we saw all the similarities in terms of market conditions, Using open as an enabling strategy seems like a, a very promising way to go in order to make textbooks available to all students. Um, this led to the, the creation of sort of a corollary to open access journals, uh, 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 open educational resources. These are textbooks, courseware, learning materials of all kinds that, like open access journal articles, are freely, immediately available coupled with the rights to reuse them fully in the digital environment. Um, the, well, we say coupled with the rights sort of generically uh, and then use uh, the, the conditions articulated by CC BY licenses in general to define open access. 
the um, open ed movement uses the five R's. I argue it's six R's because you want to be able to actually read the textbooks as well as reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, and retain. Uh, but David Wiley, who coined the five R's, is, you know, this is, this is canonical at this point, is not opening it up for discussion, and, and I'm fine with that. Um, we've had lots of success, like in the journal arena, in terms of creating uh, open educational resources in the form mainly of free textbooks, courseware, and such. Uh, companies like, or organizations and companies like Lumen Learning and OpenStax, uh, some of their titles pictured here, have introduced high quality open textbooks, open courseware. We've also seen a proliferation of funding coming to higher education campuses from states uh, to support the creation and generation of uh, open educational resources and textbooks and also from the federal government. Um, just last week, we learned that the US Congress will, for the fourth year in a row, actually appropriate uh, $6 million to uh, campuses in the US to create educational res open educational resources. So good, right? Things are moving along in both the journal marketplace or arena and the textbook arena. Yet, despite this, right, despite the progress that we've seen to a certain point, and despite the fact that the remaining problems that, that exist in both of these areas are fundamental to the healthy functioning of faculties and students across higher education institutions, with a very few exceptions, we're finding that open access and open educational resources themselves have not really sufficiently captured the attention of leadership in higher education institutions. We don't have a huge coalition of university presidents, provosts, rectors, chancellors of research, deans of research, clamoring and calling for the adoption and the, the weaving of openness into the fabric of higher education operations. However, this is changing. And this is a moment in time that's, I think, really unique in the, the open movements writ large, where we, we have some opportunities in front of us uh, that are, are, are really quite remarkable. We see, I see things changing, and Spark sees things changing for some very specific reasons. From our vantage point at Spark, our advocacy strategies around open have always included large-scale grassroots education campaigns, wholesale policy efforts on local, state, national, and international level, but they've always also included high-level market analyses and interventions where, where appropriate. And it's our work in this, this last piece, this last area, that is having the most visible impact on our ability to actively engage the leaders at the presidential, you know, rector, provost, and uh, uh, chancellor level in higher education. And that's because the, the, the well, there's some specific reasons. Uh, as our work in the journal and textbook markets has progressed, we saw some other emerging trends that made us really sit up and take notice. Specifically, we saw that the academic publishing market, and when I say academic publishing market, I mean the journal market on the research side and the textbook and learning uh, materials market on sort of the education side together, combined into one monolithic market. Um, we're, we saw a trend of the proliferation of acquisitions of infrastructure and infrastructure providers by the players in both parts of this market that had traditionally been content providers. And we wanted to understand what this, what this trend meant. Right? We understood some of the other oper uh, sort of operational uh, aspects of the market, but seeing this you know, really made us kind of say, something's happening that we need to understand and we need to understand more deeply. So we engaged a, a high-level market expert um, who has many years of experience covering the academic uh, uh, publishing market for investors. Uh, Claudio Espese worked with us, and Claudio's here somewhere in the audience, waving over there. Hi, Claudio. Uh, to, uh, to help work with us in engaging in a high-level strategic analysis on the implications that this trend we were seeing of acquisitions of infrastructure uh, what those implications might be for higher education and leaders in higher education, it's not just our library members, right, but the institutions that we're nested in. And late last, we did, late last year, we published uh, the Spark Landscape Analysis, um, which you, is openly available and you can get at this link here if you're interested in. The results of the analysis were not completely unexpected, but they were super interesting and super unsettling all at the same time. 
So I want to talk a little bit about what we found and, um, and where that's leading us. What's been crystal clear is seeing a shift in the strategy of many companies that have traditionally been content providers away from content provision and towards becoming data analytics providers. And the infrastructure that these companies are buying and the new products that they're now selling across higher education institutions are not journals or textbooks, but other kinds of tools and services like research assessment systems, productivity tools, learning management systems, course selection and course management systems, and, and more. It's really the complex infrastructure that's critical to not just the research life cycle or to teaching and learning, but to conducting the end-to-end -end business of higher education institutions and universities in specific, which is a huge, huge trend and a huge move outside of the verticals that we thought we were gonna see uh, the activity taking place in. And what's really important to understand is the infrastructure that's being acquired, the products and services that are being generated in this space now share the common trait of generating or housing a ton of data. Research data, yes, of course, but also as textbooks and learning materials have become increasingly digital, uh, uh, it's generating a lot of data on students and students' performance at, as well. And it is a lot of data. I don't think I can overstate how, how much data we're talking about. The, the data, the, 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 blah, blah. I'm your keynote speaker. I can't get a sentence out. Hello. <laughs> this data represents a largely untapped, potentially new multi-trillion dollar market, right? So there's no, no secret or no mystery as to why this would be a, an attractive uh, strategy for companies to pursue. Um, and of course, the companies are, are not interested in acquiring this infrastructure uh, and collecting data just to store it. They're interested in analyzing it, right? They're moving to data analytics. So it's critically important that we pay attention to how those analyses are done in these, in, uh, these companies and to the algorithms in particular used to do these analyses. This is a, an important emerging issue for higher education institutions, right, to get a handle on this. Because of the nature of the infrastructure and products that are being offered, companies are now in a position to exert influence or even control over key university decisions, from research integrity to faculty productivity and performance, to student learning assessment, admissions, and university financing, and on and on and on. All of these decisions are informed by data analytics. And when the algorithms that are used to make these crucial decisions are owned by commercial vendors, they're almost always proprietary and closed. And we have no way of knowing what kind of biases may be baked into them and then ultimately being sold back to university administrators and in many cases to third parties. Additionally, many of these companies have long histories within our higher education institutions that trend towards consolidation, um, con consistently sort of moving in the direction of, uh, of consolidation. So taken all together, this really has a profound, really has profound implications for higher education's control of their missions, their finances, and their operations. It's enormously, enormously important, and now we have the attention of higher education leaders. It didn't take any, it really was not difficult uh, once we did the landscape analysis to really capture uh, the, imme the immediate attention of um, leaders in higher education institutions, as well as to kind of couple that with the continued grassroots support and attention from faculty and students that we generated already um, uh, from our work in uh, open access to journals and um, open educational resources. They all wanna know one thing, what can we do about this? What, if anything, can we do about this? Um, we've spent a lot of time uh, over the last several months thinking through uh, what potential answers to that question might look like. And uh, we do believe that there are actions that institutions can take, both individually and collectively, to both mitigate the potential negative effects of this trend, but also to leverage potential benefits, right? Trying to look at this as what it really is, right? If it's 
actually a new multi-trillion dollar market, there are opportunities there as well as potential uh, challenges for, uh, in, for all institutions. And what is really interesting is that for our academic institutions, for our educational institutions, for the education enterprise, many of the actions that we would suggest taking or that we see as potentially positive center on using open as an enabling strategy, much like in our work in the content environment. Um, we're currently working on a solutions roadmap document that will be released in the next, hopefully, uh, several weeks, um, certainly within a month, um, as a corollary to the landscape analysis, also in collaboration, close collaboration with Claudio. Um, and in that, this document, we've essentially mapped out sort of three broad categories of responses that higher ed institutions can and should uh, think about doing. And these range from risk mitigation strategies, which are things we think any sort of well-managed uh, individual institution can do right away to kind of get a handle on things, to larger strategic choices, again, that individual institutions will need to wrestle with, but that not, uh, not all institutions will come up with the same uh, uh, decisions on, and then a set of co collaborative or community actions that institutions might consider taking together. And I'll give you a few examples from the risk mitigation set, just to give you a quick set sense of the kinds of proposed actions it suggests and how openness is sort of inherent in uh, that decision making, uh, this decision making process. Um, when we're thinking about the risk mitigation strategies right, or actions, these are these sort of immediate actions that we think higher education institutions need to do. We think first and foremost, uh, they need to consider data as, bleh, data as a strategic asset and to revisit and revise institution, <coughs> educational institution-wide um, data policies. We scraped and looked at a whole bunch of data policies across higher education institution and were really struck by the fact that they tend almost to a, a, a policy to be tactical and technical in focus. And they focus on things like blocking unauthorized use, right? They're, they're, they're about firewalls and password protections and keeping people out. Instead of universities thinking about the enormous amount of data that they're generating as a strategic asset that needs policies on authorized use, right? How do we want to use our data? Um, so really thinking about being strategic in thinking about the, the uh, data as, a, as an asset. In the United States, uh, earlier this year, we were fortunate, Spark advocated very hard and very hard for, and we were, we were pleased to have signed into law the US Open Government Data Act, which um, essentially asks all of our federal agencies, um, which all are data, data intensive produ pr pr producers, uh, to put in uh, new data policies and to treat their data as a strategic asset. So what we're thinking about doing and what we're looking at doing on um, academic campuses, on educational campuses, actually mirrors the national strategy that the US is taking in terms of uh, really treating data as a strategic asset. Along with this, one of the things that we see on our campuses, and you'll hear all the time when you go, it doesn't matter what campus you go on to, they'll talk about how decision making is decentralized across the campus. We think that higher education institutions really need to have a, a policy for how they treat data strategically and have a central point of coordination for making decisions about how data is used um, both, uh, uh, both strategically and uh, tactically. And that means establishing a chief data officer wherever possible. The Open Government Data Act actually requires that in our federal agencies now. We're not suggesting that it should be a requirement on campuses, but think about a central point like a chief data officer, or at the very least, a data coordinating committee or a steering committee. Decisions on higher education campuses need, uh, on data use need to be deliberate, considered, thoughtful not piecemeal, where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand doesn't know what the left foot is doing or signing away in terms of data use rights. Um, really critically important. Just as important, um, we, we think that higher education institutions really need to think about mission and values when thinking about uh, 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 contracting for or um, uh, provisioning any kind of infrastructure, product, or service that touches or generates data, and to develop principles to help guide uh, 
the, the purchase of these services in order to stay in tune with mission. Earlier this year, um, we worked with, we at Spark worked with the co uh, Coalition of Open Access Repositories with CORE and developed an initial set of good practice principles for this layer of infrastructure. Um, we hope this is a starting point and we hope that the community will look at these uh, principles and help refine and evolve them and then ultimately use them in critical, the critical decision making process of purchasing infrastructure. Um, universities, uh, higher ed institutions, we think should really review and revise their procurement and contracting processes to make sure that we're empowering and enabling appropriate ownership and use of all of our data, right? And to do this in a way, using adherence to these good practice principles to make sure contracting terms and conditions are aligned with institutions, mission, and values. It may seem weird to say the route to making sure that your uh, institution's operations, that's, that the route for them to stay independent and open and in tune with your mission is actually to embed more openness into the process of contracting and procurement, but we believe that that is actually the case. So think about things when you are contracting with uh, a, a, a third party vendor for infrastructure that generates or stores data that make sure that openness is baked into contracts, right? No non-disclosures, no exclusive use of data, right? No locking it down, but keeping it open by reta retaining data ownership. Writing in provisions for the openness and transparency of any algorithms used in data analysis. Stating preferences for open source software. Making sure we have migration strategies that allow us to keep openness baked into this process. It's critically important for higher education institutions to take the time to map out a comprehensive strategy for really rethinking our relationship with commercial uh, vendors. There is no way that a, a, a reasonable strategy for higher education institutions is not to do business with commercial providers who provide high quality services, right? We would get nowhere in terms of doing advocacy, advocacy to say, don't buy that research assessment system or that learning management system because it's commercial, um, especially when there's no alternative or not no high quality alternative for an institution to turn to to buy instead, right? That's not a credible strategy. What is a credible strategy to say, when you are contracting for one of these pieces of infrastructure or services, you need to be deliberate and pay attention to all of these things, right, in terms of being aware of what, what data you have and the value of that data to your campus, the specific value of that data to your campus, and then making sure that you write contracts that it have provisions that ensure that, that, that your uh, procurement process stays in tune and provides you with the ability to retain control over your own destiny uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of, of uh, the data layer on your campus. The goal for us, right, is really just to treat this as an emerging market, which it is, right, a, a huge emerging market, and to make sure that unlike what's happened in the content market, that this layer stays locked open for competition, right? So that even if there isn't now uh, an open, uh, born open piece of infrastructure that could compete or a service that's owned by the community that can compete with a commercial offering, there's at least an opportunity for those kinds of uh, alternatives, um, competitors to rise up and to play a role in the market. We just don't want to have a repeat of what we've seen in both the textbook marketplace and the journal marketplace take root in the data marketplace that's emerging out of our higher education institutions. So in working on all of this, um, it's been a, a, a very interesting and, and, and sort of instructive process that we've done um, in consultation with higher education institutions. And when I say that it hasn't been hard to get their attention, I'm, I'm really not kidding. Uh, we've been working since the, be the beginning of putting together the landscape analysis with a, lar a, a number of um, leaders on different university campuses, mainly across the U.S. and Canada, um, but we've also done consultation with universities here in, in Europe um, as well as in Australia. But by engaging university leaders as we were conducting the market analysis, we were doing it really to check our work first and foremost, 
um, in, in advance of doing a communications campaign to sort of draw university leaders in, but it paid dividends in a really interesting way. Um, oh, and I also should say, uh, we're not only working with individual university leaders, but also with higher education um, associations. So the American Association of Universities, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, with a corollary to the European um, Association of Universities, or LERU, here in, in Europe, uh, to get this on their radar screen and on their agendas so that uh, aw the awareness level can go up even more quickly. And that's been really successful. What's been really interesting is this is a snippet from a letter that um, went out earlier this year, right after our landscape analysis went out, um, from uh, two faculty committees uh, of the University of California system. Um, the, uh, we had worked with a vice chancellor for research on one of the UC campuses as one of our early uh, sort of champions and guides in developing the landscape analysis. And our, an early draft of our uh, landscape analysis was shared with some of the faculty um, across the UC campuses. We didn't know that something had been percolating on their campus where they were becoming aware that of the six UC campuses, something like five of them had purchased commercial research assessment systems and that faculty were becoming aware of that, those purchases and were getting really nervous over the implications of having their research output assessed by a third-party commercial uh, closed algorithm uh, and wanted to make sure that the university administration was aware that they really were uneasy about not being able to understand what the algorithm that these re commercial research assessment packages were using, what, what was the criteria that they were going to be judged on, right? Rather than being judged by their department heads or deans, they were super nervous about this notion of an algorithm, and good on them, they should be nervous. So they took actually um, the preliminary recommendations that uh, were folded into uh, our landscape analysis along with the analysis itself and um, called on uh, the, the faculty to, through the, 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 the system-wide faculty senate uh, to um, uh, endorse uh, going to the university system's president and asking her to take action to form a committee to make sure that these systems were looked at, that the algorithms were either unpacked or that an alternative was put in place. Um, and interestingly, the resulting faculty letter to the UC system that went out was ultimately endorsed unanimously by the, uh, the academic senate of the system um, and the, the, the letter itself quoted our report and concluded by noting um, the central importance of awareness and action uh, of, of, of community action on the effective function um, of universities. And this is actually how our report concludes and we loved that they included this in their, in their letter. We believe that there's still time for the academic community to act and that now is the time to do it by taking stock of the situation, asking the right questions and choosing the right course of action the academic community can prevent itself from winding up in a position where it's obligated to follow a path out of its control and potentially harmful to its future. We therefore propose that this report and a resolution on behalf of the academic senate that endorses the above recommendations be sent to the president. That report was sent a few months ago and was actually approved and the University of California will be acting on these recommendations. So we're thrilled that in, even in advance of uh, the uh, uh, upcoming roadmap, solutions roadmap, we're seeing action, we're seeing the sense of urgency on higher education campuses that we hoped to, to see. All this is to say that when we talk, when we talk, we are talking about open education, we're not just talking about open educational resources, although they're important. We're not just talking about journal articles as open educational resources or textbooks or learning materials, but rather the, the, we're talking about a series of decision points for all participants in the higher education environment to consider. Open education is actually a process, and it's a process that's central to the healthy functioning of higher education in, institutions. And at Spark, I'm gonna close by, by just reiterating where I started, our commitment is to creating a comprehensive strategy to catalyze progress towards a research and education ecosystem that's truly open and equitable for all. 
I'm looking forward to your questions and the discussion. Thank you so much for listening. Microphone, so I'll have to come up with you. Come up with uh, you. Uh, thank you so much. I, um, I think one of the really important things that struck me is about taking an active choice yes. in this. Yes. And the different actors in this system have that choice to make. And what are the choices that they, will, they, they are prepared to make yes. uh, uh, and take? But over to the audience. Could I ask that you um, get hold of a microphone and you speak slowly, please? So, Adam. While you're getting the microphone, I, I do, do want to follow up on that. The idea of deliberate choice and deliberate decision making was a theme that flowed through everything that we found in the landscape analysis and in conversations on campuses the notion of controlling your own destiny rather than leaving it up to fate was something that I think resonates deeply, not just in risk mitigation strategies, which was the one bucket that I talked about, but also in the strategic choices that'll be different institution by institution. This really is a multi-trillion dollar market. Some higher education institutions may want to look at how to uh, leverage, monetize, commoditize some of their data. That's an anathema to some higher ed institutions, and it's a, no, a non-starter for some layers of data. But for other layers of data and for some institutions, it's a real possibility for them to rethink about if we monetize a layer of data, what can we do in terms of changing the economics of our, our particular institution in terms of tuition, making it more affordable for students to attend college and things like that. And Adam, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no. Hello. Hi, um, Adam Hyde from COCO. Um, thank you for that really fascinating presentation. Uh, lots of questions, but one very specific one, kind of fascinated by um, the concern about being able to get a visibility into the algorithms. Obviously we need this society-wide. <laughs> it's a big problem right now, but um, yeah. But I'm interested, when you're dealing with a commercial vendor whose secret source is a proprietary algorithm, very specifically, I mean, how do you, I mean, what would it look like to be able to see that? Because unless yeah. you actually see it, you're not going to know what's going on. Yeah. So, so I'm just interested how, I mean, I know it's a difficult problem. I don't mean to put you on spot. I'm just wondering, like, on a on a day-to-day on a -day basis on what a practical meeting might look like, how would this roll out? Yeah, I, th it's a great question, and I don't pretend to have the technical expertise to say this is how you unpack a proprietary algorithm or this, this is exactly what you ask for. I think where we are at this point is really at, at the level of being aware that there is a proprietary algorithm at play and looking to see what are our options in, in this space. Uh, if someone can figure out what the mo when someone figures out what the model is for the right language to ask for and what the process looks like to be able to see not only the data, the underlying data that this algorithm is, is working on, but what are the components that are going into it, that's going to be a, that's a nice business. I'll just, I'll, I'll say that. Hi, I'm Eric Merkel Sabota from De Gruyter. Um, I have two short questions. One is on the, well, I mean, first of all, we can all agree textbooks, if you put kids through college, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's quite a chunk. Um, but one of the things that I was missed from one of your slides is the CPI textbook costs. What about tuition costs in there? Yeah. I can't imagine <laughs> that has been stable. That has been a long CPI, and I think <clears throat> in all fairness, that should have been included. Yep. That's the, the first thing. And the second thing is, um, I'm not quite sure what the problem is, why, I mean, I'd be interested in hearing from, from other people. With the many options we have for open access books now, including us um, and others in the room, why isn't this happening for textbooks? What do you think is keeping some of the other people in this room from writing textbooks and using the, using the open access system for books. Yeah. So two, two, two pieces to your puzzle. There is, Nicole actually has a slide that includes the cost of tuition, which has gone up 
and believe it or not, um, in most graphs, the, the cost of, of textbooks actually still outpaces the rise in tuition. Um, textbook costs 240% over two decades. Tuition is up there, but not quite that high. And again, I should say that this, um, uh, the, 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 the graphs are, are based on US indicators. Our market analysis is generally on um, US-based uh, uh, college and university materials. Um, but yeah, it is an excellent point. And not just if you have kids in college, but if you have one headache to college, like I, I'd like to unpack this in the next two years before mine has to go and uh, we're, 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 we're hit with those costs. Um, one statistic that I will address the second half of your question, but one statistic I didn't include in this discussion is when we're looking at um, the cost of learning materials uh, uh, for students, it tends, the cost tends to be about uh, 1,200 US dollars a year for textbooks and learning materials. And in the US, if you're attending, uh, for example, a technical or two-year community college, that's also the cost of tuition for some of our more affordable institutions. We find students then having the tension of, of being faced with, I can either pay my tuition or textbooks. I can't do both, and they can't afford to attend uh, school, which is a ridiculous choice that no family or student should face um, especially when considering the most affordable option we have in the U.S. to provide a path to higher education. Um, as to why, it's ha why this is, has, has happened in the textbook market, I mean, students are a captive audience, right? You, you need to buy the learning materials that you're required to buy for the class, or as we've seen, um, the statistics bear out, your chances of succeeding in getting a, a, a higher education uh, decline. Um, and while there has been some uptake of open by many, by many players, some of the largest commercial providers have opted instead to, to sort of take half measures towards open um, and moved into models that are called inclusive access, right? So they're low, bundling things together, bundling learning materials together, and selling them to the university in the form of a catalog. So if students on your campus choose materials out of one company's catalog, they're deeply discounted. They're not free, they're not open, they're not reusable. Students don't own them, they disappear. Their password or access code disappears at the end of the year. They don't have a textbook to take with them into perpetuity, uh, but it is slightly lower cost. So we've seen this in the journal marketplace too, right? With big deal journal packages where we license material on an ephemeral basis. So it's maximizing the, the profitability of the, of the market, that is really, the motivation, I think, that keeps many of the players from moving into the pure uh, sort of open mode. Despite the fact that OpenStax, Lumen have demonstrated that there are successful business models for providing open textbooks and being able to continue the traditional model of providing royalties to the authors that provide um, material for these textbooks. Um, we started a couple of minutes late. We have time for one more question. Right in the middle. Right in the middle, I think it's, uh, I can't see that it's Sally. Yes. Good eyes. <laughs> Too late. Hello, Sally Rumsey, University of Oxford, Bodleian Libraries. Thank you very much. That's been a fascinating talk and um, a lot to take back with me there. Well, it's more a comment, actually, than a, than a question in that um, it's not just about resources and data, I think. It, um, at the Researcher to Reader conference earlier this year, I asked a major publisher um, if they were moving into being an educator as well as a publisher, to which the answer was a resounding yes. Yeah. Um, uh, some publishers have got these online campuses now which they're putting out there where um, you know, the uh, people who take these things can get um, certificates for completion signed by the managing director. And um, one of the things I've noticed about them is that um, academics and my own profession, librarians, seem to be giving their services free um, by providing online courses and uh, tutorials on these sorts of campuses. And I think it's, it's much more than just the data, it's the expertise and scholarship which is going up there as well, free of charge, and um, we're giving it away. I think that's an excellent point. I know um, Cameron's going to talk later today more about uh, the operations of the universities from a slightly different perspective. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think some of the decisions that we're, we're making, we're making in, almost in little 
silos, if not vacuums, on our campuses. We think we may be, con we may think we're contributing to something that's beneficial, but we're not taking the time to look at this issue holistically from sort of the, the top layer down and also the perspective of the, the folks that we're trying to serve on our campuses, grassroots up. We have a moment in time where we have exigencies that are kind of forcing us to unpack these silos and to look at things holistically. And I think it's a moment in time where we really can capitalize on this and think about reshaping education and educational institutions. And my, our fondest hope is that we do that with the lens of using open as an enabling strategy to keep the operations as tightly coupled to the values and missions of uh, our education institutions as we can. So. Thank you. Stop there. Yes, thank you so much, yes. um, Heather. I, I think. Um,